I'm Jason Sylvia, and this is The Creative Capital Show. A show about creative people and how those creative people turn into entrepreneurs by taking their creativity and turning it into a business and facing all the trials and tribulations along the way. When it comes to content creation, especially content creation for social media, to say that video is having a moment right now would be an understatement. With the rise of Instagram stories, YouTube shorts, and the platform that really put short form video under the spotlight, TikTok, video, especially good video content, is more important than ever. But what goes into making objectively good video content? Is style more important than technical ability? Have the rules of video content creation changed in a post-TikTok world? To answer these questions, and talk about a whole lot more, is this episode's guests, Henry Kerskins and Austin Dellen of House PVD. House describes themselves as a creative studio specializing in video production, photography, social media, and digital marketing. This combined with a passion for visual storytelling, means House doesn't just make content, they create cinematic experiences. In this episode, I sit down with Henry and Austin and talk about their inspiration for picking up a camera, creative ways to use credit to finance gear, leveraging relationships to gain your first clients, video content creation in the corporate world versus being a freelancer, how to balance your artistic drive while acknowledging a client's wants and needs, Which metrics, if any, determine a successful video? Why sometimes people mistake creative agencies for marketing agencies, and vice versa. And a whole lot more. Oh, and one final thing. There was so much value in this conversation that I wanted nothing on the cutting room floor. So this episode is a two-parter. Enjoy. I mean, there is a couple things I could do. The day's not over yet. There's Never still is. time for feedback to come in. Well, That's true. Henry, yeah. Austin, thank you for coming on to the podcast. And uh, thank you for having me in your lovely studio space. Yeah. Uh, Dude, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having Happy us. to be on it. Yeah. yeah. The way you two um, met, I want to go into that a little bit first because you both met through or with uh, another guest on the show, Kyle. Well, kind of building not, the podcast. Not universe exactly. Guests. Okay, not, not exactly. No, me and Austin, no. Yeah, me and Austin okay. existed before. I think we met Kyle together. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. We all worked together, and that's how you know we're friends now and collaborators. But no, it was me and Austin were together from the, the start, at least in Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I, I know we just made a joke about this earlier, but if you had to give the elevator pitch of what you do and what you guys both do and who you guys are, what would that elevator pitch be? Just so anybody listening is like, wait a minute, who are these guys? Even though the episode description should have told you, in case you don't feel like reading, yeah. what do you both do? Well, I mean, it's funny that you heard us talking about that. I mean, the simplest way to put it is we're just a, we're a full service video production company. And um, we're also like a boutique agency. So there are days where we're not necessarily doing just video, even though that's kind of like what comes first in terms of our business model. So so going along with how you both met, so you both met before you met Kyle. So that was that was my mistake. Um, but it's interesting that, you know, it's I think it speaks to Providence in the state that like everybody kind of knows everybody. If nobody's realized that from the podcast yet. A lot of the people I've had on the show know other people I've had on the show. So you do yeah. both know Kyle, which um, go listen to that episode. Go listen to Kyle's episode. But finish this one first, then go listen to that, and then go <laughs> listen to more, because then it helps me get my thing up. Anyway, um, so how did you both originally meet? Because what was interesting as I was doing the research for the show is that you both worked for Colette. Did you both work there at the same time? Yeah, that's such like a... Yeah. Yeah. That's like way later in, in like how we met. But, oh, okay. But okay. like... I don't it know. Is a, it's part of the journey for yeah. sure. We have um, a very big journey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, long journey. I would say, you know, I, not a lot of people know this, but we did go to the same high school back in the day. We weren't necessarily friends, so we, but we were mutual connections. And 
a mutual friend of ours actually introduced us to one another. We were kind of on our own paths, both both pursuing video and some, you know, to some degree. Um, and he was kind of just like, hey, you guys should get together. He said that to both of us. And we ended up just, you know, sharing recent work with one another, hiring each other for gigs that came in, freelancing together. And ultimately, it just kind of made sense for us to come together and, and, you know, form something a little bit more legitimate, you know, than just two freelancers, you know, hiring each other, basically. So you were both in the world of video and like video production and content from your high school days? Well, I did a lot of video in high school, but it was mainly just like skate videos and stuff. It wasn't professional um, at all, but I do kind of come from like a, yeah, like a visual background in that, in that way. But after, you know, after I got done with school and everything, I just kind of freelanced and that's what I was doing for quite some time. Um, and then I met Henry. So Yeah, and I, and I can't say that I, I mean, I did make like, videos with my friends I think like you know in childhood but like I think I was just a creative person I'd say it had more of like a an illustration background before I got into video and it wasn't until like college that I got like a camera in my hand that that's when I kind of like discovered uh, a route I wanted to take so you had more of like at least in the early creative years more design illustration related Mm. and then were you doing um music yeah, I mean, even before video came along, I think music has always been like my first love. But, you know, uh, they kind of go hand in hand, right? Music and video kind of go hand in hand, especially when it comes to editing. So, you know, just being a musician, um, you know, yeah, it kind of all ties in together. But yeah, music and video has just always kind of been my thing. So I can't get away from it. So, And so the way you both met was just hopping on each other's projects then? Sort of. Yeah. I mean, we both... Like after college, I went to URI, but I moved here right after I graduated. And Austin happened to move to Providence around that exact same time. And I just think that, you know, our worlds kind of collided out here. Just you know good I mean? timing, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And, you know, on some of, my, some of the episodes, if, you know, folks have been listening to the show for a while, sometimes I deep dive into like the early life stuff, but because I have multiple guests on and I'm, there's going to be more multiple guest episodes, everybody. So just brace yourselves for that. But um, because I have multiple guests, on, I do want to like not get too, too much into it only because the story of your mm. company is really interesting as well. And we're going to get into that part. Um, but one question I do have about, um, you know, your early life for both of you, and it's something I've noticed uh, can vary between um you know folks that have been on the show so i want to get your both individual experiences with this when it comes to family like it's interesting and i think this is this dynamic is starting to change but i think like i think maybe and i'm dating myself here maybe millennials are going to be like the last generation where the idea of doing a creative like field is just like oh you're not going to make any money or blah 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 and i think maybe that'll like keep going but not as much as it is like i think that that shift is starting to happen a little bit even with parents and stuff right it's an interesting question it's um, a great for us. So, yeah. so i was gonna say like yeah did you both have like did either one of you have the dynamic of like hey i want to do like did you know like hey i want to do create like something in the creative world as a living from an early on age and if so you know um because not all parents are like like you know at least especially like up until this generation maybe this generation like after i think there's going to be there's going to be like a point where you're going to see it's different were they like yeah we support you or like are you really going to make any money in that or are they going to say like hey do this as a hobby and like because there's no real money in it like how did that work out for both you just in your life it's really funny that you bring that up because i feel like me and austin go back and forth on it i'm not going to speak for austin but i'd say our our two lives were very different because austin did have a creative family whereas uh, i did not uh, my dad's like super blue collar, um, self-made man, owns his own business. But um, they definitely didn't see like what I'm doing now as like an option in terms of like a career. So I think as a millennial, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, we have all these social media platforms and TikTok now where like all the like the Gen Zers and kids that are younger, like they're kind of they grew up into this. Whereas for us, like it didn't exist yet. We kind of like millennials bridge both worlds, right? Where it's like we were before the internet. I was going to say we're we're the last generation to know what what it was, what life was like before the internet existed, right? Which is insane when you think about it. But it has a huge impact on your upbringing, right? Especially like the way your parents see things and careers and all that stuff. So for me, yeah, dude, like 100%. Like I wouldn't say, love you, mom and dad. Just want to put that out there. But uh, they didn't see 
this as like a real thing. Um, like when I graduated college, it was just like, well, what are you going to do now? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I did work like the corporate video world for a while. I want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, until Definitely. I couldn't do it any longer. And if it wasn't for Austin, truthfully, I, I don't think I would, really would have had the confidence to just like pull the bandaid off and like jump right into that like freelance world. I didn't see it like as a thing for me or an option. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So. Yeah, I feel that. Anything else? Uh, no, I think I'm yeah, just gonna we... keep it as brief as possible for that. But you, <laughs> yeah. you catch my drift. Yeah. No, I, um, Austin, just uh, you know, going off of that. So you yeah. came from a creative family, so it was a little bit more of an accepted like. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. he's gonna, I, you know, the rest of us are creative, so it's, it makes sense. Hundred percent. I think, you know, um, I was super lucky growing up. My dad, um, basically started a design and branding web development company. It just became like full service design and you know, in about in every category you could think of. Um, and that grew, especially through like, you know, the internet being a thing. And so I think he started this company in like 1990 or like the early 90s. Oh, wow. So, so you no, know, you can imagine the, the growth in that and, and just seeing that kind of entrepreneurial side and just having that in the family was, you know, at first I, of course I saw him super stressed out when he was building this thing, but then I was just kind of in awe of, of what he was able to do uh, the living he was able to make from that. Um, and not to mention my mom is also a painter and she also, uh, like her, but her actual job is to restore old paintings and antiques. So basically making a living of the arts was what I grew up to know. So in that sense, I'm super lucky because my family was always supportive and they always, they, they, they pushed me to go to school for film. They pushed me to do a film program because they saw that as well. You know, this guy's maybe, I wasn't the best student, but I was pretty good at, at the stuff that I liked to do, which was music and video. So kind of made that come together when they pushed me to go to school for it. And it happened to work out. I kind of tricked myself into liking video even more than music. And then eventually I was like, I, I really like this. And I got some I got good support from the, the peers that I met at school. And it just kind of just kept rolling. It snowballed into something legit. And then, yeah, of course, meeting Henry kind of obviously that that solidified it so it's so interesting to like the contrast of um and one thing i want to get your opinion both of your opinion on it seems like on the one side you have a family where it's like well how are you gonna make money on that and on the other side the proof i guess the so, like the proof or the social proof of like being able to make money at that was already within your family so for them to fathom like it's basically the art of the possible, like, because it was already known. Like, yeah, like you can look outside yourself and be like, yeah, this is possible. But when, it's a little bit different when somebody, you know, is able to do right, or somebody, right. your family's able to do it. So it's like, oh, OK, like now. Yeah, they can legitimately because like this other person, in the family's already done it. So I think it's interesting yeah. where Austin was a great like, I don't know. Uh, he kind of opened up a world that I didn't know was possible. And I would say in our relationship, I'm definitely like the dreamer of the group. And I think that my <laughs> upbringing kind of impacted my, I don't know. That's interesting. Cause you think it'd be the opposite. You think, you, would think, you think Austin would be, well, yeah, you grow up, no, but you grow up like thinking this is impossible. And then when you realize it is attainable, you know, it kind of like expands what you now know could be possible. Yeah. So that realization of things being possible, is that what um, pushed both of you to go to school and study this? What, what was the, um, cause I, cause Austin, I know you were saying you were a, music guy yep. and so I'll, you know you would think like one would think oh they would study audio school, or, or yeah, like go to berkeley or, yeah. or, or berkeley or if you're going to do like more the technical side of it like hey i'll you know kind of doing um what kyle did and like learning yeah. the studio audio or the live audio aspect you went into video and then you went into video so what were the um you know what were the reasons behind uh Hey, not only is like not only am I interested in this thing in my high school years, my adolescent years, but now I'm gonna like go actually study it to the degree of like going to school for it. Well, my situation was just weird because I mean I went to school for calm, which is so broad. You know what I mean? I knew I wanted to get into something creative. Did I know it was gonna be this? No. And okay. I think, and I'm also a, I, I think I left this part out, but I'm like a film, like a movie buff. So I, I kind of grew up watching and like obsessing over like films and directors. So like there was always that side of things, but I never knew I, just, I was going to like be involved in like video production or, you know, like filmmaking, whatever. Right. Yeah. I, I thought it was going to be like something just like, oh, I'm going to work for an, an advertising agency or whatever, be a pencil pusher. I, I don't know, which I did do for a short period of time after college. But I noticed that on the LinkedIn. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was all right. It was a great learning experience. It gave me like a more business entrepreneurial aspect to video, I guess. So it, it was like a good stepping stone. You saw the corporate yeah. structure for what it but, was. But I, <laughs> but I majored in communications in college. And it wasn't until I just took like a film class as kind of like a, a bullshit elective. Let's just call it that. Sorry. But that I... Yeah, can we swear on this? Oh, yeah. You can see yeah. whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> right, sweet, sweet. But yeah, it was a bullshit elective, yeah. dude. All it was was r- watching movies and stuff. You know what I mean? And I just think for somehow, some way, that kind of just segged into like, oh, shit, like, I really like this. I think the professor that I had, too, was really encouraging, and he motivated me. He was like, Henry, I think you should consider double majoring. So then I went film route. Granted, I didn't do a whole lot film-wise. It wasn't until, like, after college that, like, I bought my own camera and started kind of, like, you know, financing my own gear and watching YouTube videos, truthfully, that it kind of, like, I went all in. But, like that's where at least it started for me. Whereas I feel like Austin jumped into, you know, mm. the hands-on filmmaking, like right off the rip. You know what I mean? Like he went in knowing like, Oh, like I'm going to go this route. Whereas for me, it took a bit more time to like kind of figure that out. Mm. So, yeah, I guess in the sense that like, like I said, I mean, you know, it seems kind of silly, but it is a common thread for a lot of video people. Like it, it started with skate videos and stuff. So I was very familiar with just the idea of shooting a bunch of stuff putting in a timeline, cutting it up, editing it. And so, you know, my, my parents encouraged me to try this uh, program that BU offered. It's like a one year, very technical hands-on thing. It was kind of like in and out. It's kind of like what you make of it, but it was very, you know, there was a lot of real world experience. There was a lot of real creative application. And so, you know, I think after a while I got some traction. It seemed like you know, me and a couple other guys in the class, we kind of like had a good handle on things. And, you know, like, yeah, my professors were like, hey, you know, you should really look at this as a career opportunity. And that's kind of when it really changed for me because I, you know, I took that seriously. And also, you know, truthfully, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, so much of like a cinematic movie director dreamer. Um, I actually already had the perspective of seeing what my dad did with his creative agency, you know, with his design and branding. And I was like, well, I kind of want to do that, but with video, like make small business commercials, do like branded content. So, you know, it, this set me up in a great place and Henry's mind was already there and he had his corporate experience. So again, just like the, the blend of, of our collective experience worked out, you know, afterwards. And I want to hold on to that. Cause like, I want to dive into that path a little bit as well. With that, Cause I have some questions on that. Sure. Um, but one thing, uh, and this just came up. This wasn't even one of my planned questions, but I think you both brought up um, something that I think is worth asking. You both each had, it seems like, a professor or maybe multiple professors that came to you and said, hey, you're good at this. Like, You, you should really seriously consider pursuing it. Um, and that doesn't always happen for like creatives. You know, like, like especially like somebody, I don't want to say an authority figure, because like when you're in like, you know, college, like you are technically, I'm Put, I'm doing air quotations here that nobody can see. You're <laughs> mm-hmm. technically an adult. But um, how how important do you think it was that you both had that outside validation of somebody encouraging you and saying, like, hey, the work you're doing is good, good enough that, like, you should really pursue this? For me, um, I think it was super, you know, uh, it was huge. Like, for just for, like, that confidence, I don't think I had that. And hearing it, that validation from somebody else was like encouraging. You know what I mean? And that that was one professor that I had, but it wasn't until like I, you know, I ended up double majoring, of course. I met a documentary film professor who, you know, had a huge impact on like the route I took. Um, so yeah, I think so. hundred percent, man. I think that a lot of people need a mentor or someone with that platform or experience to show you, you know. And you can't get that from YouTube. Mm. Or you I can, think, I think you like, can now, but, but, but I think oh, you don't get like the personal connection of, and, of it. Now. Right. And when I went to college, it was like pre YouTube. Like it wasn't like the influencer, like tutorial thing that we have now. You know what I mean? Like those resources, I think those like those prominent figures in the space didn't really exist yet, at least not for me. You know what I mean? So, but, mm. but and even so that kind of communication, even with like the, the YouTube and everything, it's very one way. Like you're not getting validated unless you buy their course or some shit. But right. that, like, yeah, you're not getting that validation where it's just like you could be following the steps, but you don't like 
you also don't know anything about these people, even though yeah. you think you do. Yeah. Whereas like I do find that some of these YouTubers now, um, not everyone, but they're YouTubers that are teaching people how to do things that don't actually have that real world experience. They're just really good at educating and at presenting yep. it. It's yes. This, it's the kind of, it's like that saying those who, not to say that everybody who teaches can't do, but it's like those who can't like teach or something like that. that was it that, that, school rock or something? No, it, oh, I, yeah. it was, I think it was school for scoundrels. I think that's what, it, that's what it was from school for scoundrels. Uh, which I'm trying to remember that was Billy Bob Thornton and the dude from um yeah 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 but I'm also there is that line though in School of Rock where he's like Jack Black saying like those who can't do teach and those who can't teach teach Jim or something oh, okay. like that okay you know what actually you <laughs> might be right all right yeah. I was gonna say I was, I was like that's from both movies great actually. movie um I've seen both and I've laughed my ass off at both of them uh so that's that's interesting like to get, getting that validation now how uh awesome and, like how yeah, is that I, for you oh yeah I would say equally as important um my editing teacher who you know was a, obviously a, a great supporter but in and to the point where like i would show him like personal projects and he would give me tips on how to like enhance the project so i just thought that was so cool and then you know i might have done a couple small uh commercials and stuff while i was in class but i did like freelance work on the side with my friends and i would show my teachers and they were like you know dude like th not a lot of people even get to this level of work and of course this was me with my T2I or like a rental from school. So I wasn't doing anything groundbreaking, but you know, to, to be in that position, to be able to get live feedback on, on real world experience. And then to have, you know, my editing teacher who had done contract work for Reebok, you know what I mean? He had done a lot of post work for like a lot of um, indie films and stuff like that. And, and some, some bigger stuff. It was, that was huge, you know, just to have that real world perspective and to know also to know that it's not always glamorous, but it's like you're going to make a living if you are determined. So it's possible. You know? So staying on the subject of learning in school, um, I do have a question on the balance, if any, because I feel like this can vary depending on the school you go to. So I've, I've beaten this story to death on the podcast, but I'll briefly bring it up just to give context to the question. Whereas I've talked to people that have gone to RISD and from what I understand, and maybe it's changed, but at the time that they went, RISD was teaching more about like creative, like I guess theory, like, theory, and like mm -hmm. this is the way to do it creatively or the high, but like as far as like more of a real world everyday, like this is what you really need to know to get the everyday commercial job and what insert artistic field here. They're 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 not teaching that yeah. at all, which I feel like that can be a bit unless you're going to be like a certain type of artist, which not many people even get to that, even if they go to right, the best schools. Right. I, I don't want to speak for like you know universities. You know, I mean, I only went to one, so I, I can't like vouch for that. But what I can tell you is, a, like you said, a lot of say, film the personal experience for you yeah. was it more on the creative app, nah, or was it more on the technical? Like was, this is how you get work every day, kind of stuff. No, nah, it was more of like the fun. Like at least, like of course, there was advanced production, and like you can get a camera, not a nice one. Not when I went to school, they didn't have like what they have now, but like. I think it was very much built on like a theoretical thing where you watch movies and you get like the, the understanding of the framework. Right. Um, unless you have like a really good internship with like a production company, a lot of schools, like you're not going to get that out of them. You know what I mean? Unless you like it, it really is about how you set it up for yourself. You know what I mean? Like if you really want to have that knowledge, like you need to go out and get it on your own. Not to say that schools won't help you that they don't have, like they'll have those resources. I'm sure. Yeah. But like, no, I don't think like, at least not where I went. Like, it was very like, you're going to watch this movie. You're going to write a paper about it. You know what I mean? You're not going to mm -hmm. like pick up a camera and you're going to emulate like what you just saw. Right. Okay. So, but not to say that other schools don't do that. Just my experience and other people I've talked about, like a lot of people say that like film school don't do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You want to spend like a hundred thousand dollars to go to school. Why don't you just, you know, get a loan and buy a camera and, and start like making videos for people. I, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question for me, too, because I didn't do a four year or a two year program. Like, I actually don't even have a degree in filmmaking. So, again, the program I did was less like academic focused. It wasn't really filled with like theory and like stuff like that. It, it really was like pretty real world experience. And to this day, I'll be on a job and something will come back from the past. I'll be like, damn, they were telling me about this like when I was like 18 years old. And here I am, I'm, like 27, you know. We have a real production company and I'm I'm just now encountering a situation where actually that information becomes applicable to the situation, which is interesting because, you know, that's just that's just how it goes, you know. But I think it's more like a real world experience thing where you're going to get like 
you're going to figure out how you, as the creative that you are, make this into a business, you know, how it works for you. Because everybody has their own process, too. It's a way to do things, but different ways, you know. And just um, just to finish up the, uh, I guess, this section about education and like learning and like learning the tools of the trade and whatnot. And we're going to get in a little bit more as far as the early professional stuff. But um, in, you know, Bo, I want to get both your takes on this. Um, specifically for what you do, but even for just creatives in general, but I think for what you do even more so because now video is like the hot thing because every social media platform now is pushing video, whether whether we want it or not, we're getting video. Um, but I wanted to get your like uh, opinion on if you either had you know, a young son or daughter or like a younger sibling that says, hey, I want to do what you do, and the parents are like, can you talk to him? Or like if you had to like talk to your own kid and be like realistic with them of like, is how to really, you know, learn it the right way. Would you would you lean more towards just buy a camera and start doing stuff? Would you say, hey, go to school, but like go to this go to a school that teaches these things? Like ideally, what would you well, you know, in your personal opinions, is the best way to learn, you know, the stuff that you guys do when it comes mm-hmm. to like video and content and things like that? Is is the school route good? Are there some schools that are teaching more technical stuff? Is that the stuff that you should be learning versus the more artistic? Like what how would you ideally do it? I don't know, man, because like I don't really want to like make it's all like opinion based, right? I mean, yeah. at, the, at the end of the day, I, I think that school is good for certain people and it's not for others. You know what I mean? Like, I think for me, I, I did what I did get out of it was I did learn to be like an adult, how to do things on my own. You know what I mean? And also like some people don't have resources either. You know what I mean? Going to school is like a good step to just like, I don't know, man just like picking up a pamphlet that might change your life, you know, or, or just talking to people that have connections, you know what I mean? It's all, it's networking too. You know what I mean? Like that, that could be something really crucial for somebody where, you know, someone else might just have pure raw talent and yeah, just picking up a camera and getting thrown into it might be better for them. You know what I mean? It just, I think it's all, yeah, kind of subjective in that regard, you know? Mm. I would say that, you know, I don't know how uh, young this uh, this this kid would be, but they, let's say they just graduated high school. They're trying to figure out what's next. I guess my advice would be like take a year and try to work as a freelancer or as just a PA or just like try to try to get any kind of real world experience that you can, because you're bound to be if you actually are going to have a career in this, you're bound to be inspired by at least one facet of that, whether it's just being a PA or, you know, uh, the lighting aspect of it or the camera operation aspect or the post aspect. I mean, there's so many different avenues that even if you just want to play one role, there's a lot available to you there. So I think, yeah, I would push, take a year, see what you can get yourself as far as opportunities and real world experience on your own, because that's how it is when you have a career in it, you're back on your own. You're not in school with, with all the guidance there and then just kind of go from there. And if it doesn't happen naturally, then you know, that's your next point where you're like, I got to make a decision whether I want to invest in, you know, four years of education on this or not. So I don't know. It's, it's school is so expensive. So yeah. And that's it's kind of a scary yeah. thing for people. I can only imagine, you know, it I just feel, depends, you know, like I feel I, lucky the way I turned out. I don't know how I figured it out, but like, cause some people have no student debt. Some people do, some people get, you know, financial aid. I, I guess, I guess that's all kinds of the, the things you need to think about when, making that decision and how long is it going to take to pay off that student right debt? how much of how much of it is going to affect your personal life of like doing other right things? and i think we kind of uh, culturally we glorify going to college you know what i mean even though like i said it's not necessarily for everyone and like it it can kind of make or break you especially if you're going to graduate and you're not going to get the job you wanted and you're just left with crippling debt you know what i mean like i think we don't beat that on people's heads enough I think we just glorify yeah, this. We, oh, we you the, get a you get a degree and 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 you're mm-hmm. good to go. Life is great. And it's like, nah, dude, not for everyone. <laughs> and I think to be fair, also I think this comes like I was saying before, like there's there's the generational shifts. I think we're I I honestly think we're gonna be the last generation where the importance of have to go to school because it worked up until time. Like it worked for our parents. It made sense. Like like it's our parents just knowing what they know, they just knew, okay. Wow. Commercial break. Bike life. <laughs> it looks like a car, but yeah, that's. It sounded like, like a bike. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. yeah. Either that or it's a very 
weird car. These are the sounds of the studio. Yeah, there we go. Um, sounds of Pawtucket. You know, you know what? You need to package that and then sell it as like an ambient Pawtucket sound Pawtucket ambience. Dude, leave this mic here after and I will definitely get some. I'll build yeah. the sound pack for you right now. Yeah, and then we'll just sell that to yeah, like why not? everybody. Like yeah. sound, sounds of the city. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. For, yeah. for only the low, low price of... $500. Yeah. yeah. You can get the authentic sounds of right. a building in Pawtucket. The tones of the Blackstone River. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to really, you know, focus too much on this, but I, I do feel like if it were, if I had a kid, I would not push college on them. I'm never going to like, it's going to be their choice. You know what I mean? And I'm going to present all the, you know, ways it could go. And the access to information now is completely different. Too. 100%. You know, you, like things that you can maybe only get in a book or in a court are now like, literally on your phone and you yeah. can pull it up in five seconds and which is we completely didn't we, different. Yeah, we, didn't we didn't have, have that. that. No. <laughs> and that's, that's what's so weird you about this too. snappers got it good today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously, you do. You don't know how good you have it. Yeah. And I think that one thing, just one thing to add, I think that companies, especially smaller companies that do because content's so important, I think they do value like people that go and, and, and pitch themselves and have like a portfolio or just have something to show, to show that you're hungry, to show that you have some, you know, direction or intention behind your work. And more you, from the sounds of the city. Sound yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, in your, you know, your services can be applied to their business. I think we're in an age where like, you know, people say it's, it's not that hard to create content. So if right. you know how you're able to, and you use that to pitch yourself to companies that are in need, I think people still value that. I do recall a time where, you know, I had some help from my dad. He helped me create these little cards or pamphlets, but I literally went to an industrial park and handed them out to businesses. And they were like, dude, they were sick. They, yeah. they, they were, they were like super impressed. I was just like this kid that came in with like, you know, just a tiny portfolio of like silly work that I had done, but it was like, Hey, it made an impact on somebody. So if you can do that, you know, it's kind of more about how you right. carry yourself in that way. You got to be you have to be uh, driven, you know what I mean? But I'll say this too. Not everyone cares about a degree anymore. Just because you have a That's degree the other big doesn't paradigm make you. Shift. Yeah, yes. I don't want to push that. And, but. And, no, and, and us especially, like we're looking to hire like someday. And I don't think me and Austin have ever said, oh, they need a four-year degree. No, oh we need, you need drive, passion, skill. If you have at least those three. Got to be a good person. Yeah. Okay. Like, gotta show, be show me that you can do the work. Yeah, show yeah. that you care. So many people that, you know, graduate from college, they want to, you know, move up the corporate ladder they you know what i mean they want to jump around from company to company you know if you find the right person that is like they just have that passion that raw passion like that that is so much more valuable at least to me as a small business owner than someone that has this like piece of paper i think this is the perfect segue into a question i have um some of those first jobs because what i noticed with look uh doing my research for the both of you did you creep me on linkedin um, i did uh i did that with everybody <laughs> Uh, is, me. I, I was going to say, like, did you, do you not realize I'm trying to be the Providence Nardwar? Dude, like, I was about to say that at the beginning of this. I was like, I feel like we're on Nardwar because he's like, you guys worked for Colette. And I was like, wow. Man, yeah. Blast from the past. That's dude, crazy. Damn, yeah. yeah. But um, I, That's I awesome. think this is a perfect segue into that is that, you know, especially sometimes with more of these creative fields, when people get out of school, they have this idea, not all the time, but sometimes of like, I am going to go do like, I want to be this filmmaker, and dot, dot, dot. And there is no, what is that Will Smith speech? There is no, you can't have a plan B because if you have a plan B, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. for some people, that's fine. I've noticed that you both had corporate jobs um, in the beginning. And I guess my first question is... Not really, Austin. Just going to throw that in oh, there. Oh, okay. All right. Because I noticed, well, I noticed the Colette thing, so I, at least I got, that was I, a yeah, corporate that job. That was kind of through me. I started okay. at Colette, and they okay. were hiring, and I basically got Austin a foot in the door. Just gonna Okay, that actually, that answers that question. But I do <laughs> want to ask about, like, doing creative work in the corporate world because i think that's something that's pretty interesting and if if you could go into just how that works because i think that sometimes creative folks they're like oh i'm not going to work in that corporate thing but it's also versus freelancing it's like you kind of know what your money like unless you're on a contract with them like you kind of know what your money's going to look like so yeah. what was that like like getting those those creative jobs in a corporate environment and what what was that experience well, like I've done a bunch of things and, and I'm at least for the corporate side of things, I'm going to say this, it's, it's not for everyone. It wasn't for me because I just think that over time I got kind of burnt out. You know what I mean? When you do a, when you're working, it depends on what it is corporate too. You I was going to say, mean? what were some, like, like I, I worked the in, title, but like, what did you actually do? In I was like things? a create, like I was in the creative services. Like I basically was like the internal video guy. Let's just put it that way. I mean, you know what I mean? Like the first two jobs that I had out of college were like internal video. So like, and what I mean by you get burnt out is you're kind of like limited to 
that brand, or maybe it's a, a certain number of types of videos you're working on that are just like, you know, that's all you do. And I'm I think that's you have to play in a sandbox and you use did, like corporate logos and colors yes, and processes. And, and it never and like changes that. ever. Because they I want just, consistency. Yes. But also like, you know, some people might like that because like, you know, every day is the same. They need that structure. They want that consistent paycheck. Not everyone wants to go out and try to chase jobs. And even though it's more exciting, creative work, you know, that, that thought of like, well, my money's not consistent every month kind of scares people away. Right. For me, I think the corporate jobs were great. Because it gave me like, you know, a more buttoned up business sense. I, I knew how to like, you know, dress the part if I need to wear, wear the, the khakis and the, the collared shirt. Was that me necessarily? No, but I knew how to, I knew how to switch into that mode. You know what I mean? Um, but honestly, dude, I like really didn't enjoy the work I was doing. I wasn't like fulfilled. I like, you know, truthfully, it was like, I don't know if I'm in the right, right lane. And then I ended up working for like an agency as a producer, which taught me life, valuable life lessons as well. But I also knew exa- I didn't want to go that route either. You know, what I mean, being a producer, you know, is a really hard job that no one really ever wants to talk about, like in the film world, because you are like the this really buttoned up, you know, attention, a detail oriented, you know, client facer, the connector. You're taking the director's crazy ideas and trying to put it into some logistic logistical you know template for everyone on the team to you're trying to take something creative and put it into a repeatable process yes and i just think that's a really it's extremely hard to do right especially when you're working with different personalities you know and types of clients it just it was hard but it was it was valuable you know what i mean so so besides those two things were there anything else from like maybe a more of just like production aspect that those corporate environments because like i always find it funny like when sometimes creative folks want to shy away from like corporate life but i feel like there's sometimes working in those giant companies and those structures like they didn't get to that point by making dumb decisions apparently i mean some companies right. now do in spite of themselves but for, sure. the, for the most part um you know they get to a point because they're doing something right is there anything that you took away that maybe you didn't realize it then but maybe now uh, you realize like, oh, like that was a skill I learned from that corp, that corporate job or like that was a skill I learned from that corporate environment. Yeah, Even well, though if I wasn't enjoying it at the time, it taught me some value. Well, stuff. absolutely. But into that same point, like I think now with that corporate mindset, having had that experience, you know, it's been really beneficial for Austin and I, like because, you know, we're not out of the corporate world. You know, we run our own company, but we still produce content for corporate companies. You know what I mean? So we're we can wear that hat. We can talk the talk. You know what I mean? You can speak that language. Exactly, dude. So like, I think in that sense, it's super valuable because that is a completely separate world. Like people be like, what do you guys do? Because we do a lot of things. You know what I mean? And like, but corporate video is a huge proponent to our business that we don't like to talk about because it is boring. I'm not going to lie. It's boring, Um, but it pays the bills. You know what I mean? And having, being able to speak that language, like um, it goes a long way for us. You know what I mean? So I think it's extremely valuable. At least to have that, at least for me, having that experience was fantastic. And it depends on, I don't want to say every corporate video job is boring. You know what I mean? Like we did, I did end up working at Colette, which was fantastic because it was a travel company. And so you I was, and I worked for the same company at one time, Dell EMC. Yeah. Because you that was that, the security division RSA. Yeah. And, I, and I worked literally down the street. I didn't realize I worked down the street from you. Did you at, really? At EMC's main, there's the two main buildings for EMC. There's the corporate headquarters. In Support, Hockington. Supports across the street and then like literally connected to the support building is the little RSA building. So if you worked out of there, you and I literally work for the same company. That is crazy, Next door dude. to each other at the same time. Wow. That was a short stint. I'm not going to lie. I wasn't no, there for very just, long. Was, I could not do me. that. Yeah, that was just, that was cybersecurity and making videos for that. I was just like, nope, this is not for me. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so, mm. but yeah, man, I, I think that it was great. And then, um, I don't know. Austin, you came into Colette. You kind of got to, even though it was travel, he did get to step into the corporate world. You know, yeah. he did have to wear the the khakis and the collared shirt every oh, day. Yeah, yeah, that's my favorite part of it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think, I think it, yeah, I think the experience was great for all the same reasons Henry mentioned. I think it, you know, and it, and it shed light on the on the good and the bad. You know, that that consistency, that routine, that that consistent paycheck. You know, that's cool. Uh, but it also kind of showed me like the the dis- the different kinds of you know, the disconnect that can occur in in the corporate structure where there's just so many layers of approval. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, 
obviously you don't want too much change. You don't want too much variety when you're looking to have a consistent brand, but there's like death you know, by bureaucracy. Yeah, like nothing gets done because creativity. it has to go through like 13 people and it's yeah. like, it gets to person number four, they you know person number 14 and then they kill the whole thing. hundred yep. percent. There's a, yeah. there's value there that's squashed by, you know, people being a little bit too afraid to be, uh, being held accountable for making that call, you know? And that's, that's mm-hmm. a huge part of that. Whereas I feel like now that we have a small company, you know what I mean? Ho- hopefully faster, we yeah. will grow here. But again, like just being able to make decisions uh, directly because you are the decision maker is huge. Corporations also just, they people think that having these numbers, these big companies, they are the slowest oh, they to make moves. moves. They move yeah. so slow. Because oh, because they have to, because there's so many like little tiny things. And I have some questions about about right. this later but like yeah. that they have to consider because if anything gets misinterpreted then it, it can cost a company and their shareholders it's a house of millions. cards too man one person can have an opinion that could shift and the then, entire outcome of what was being you know formulated i think it was a couple of years ago when uh when trump was running and then it was one of the heads of marketing for new balance made like a comment about how like they individually supported Trump, but then people took it as New Balance supported Trump, and then it like turned into a snowball of like, mm. like, like there was like a four chan thing that got published on CNN and how like all these white nationalists were like, we're going to start wearing New Balances so we can identify each other, and then people were like, well, we're not going to rock with New Balance anymore. Mm. So it's so funny to go from it was so funny. I think like a few years ago there was that, and then now we got like the. Ame Leon Dor new balances that are like the hottest thing. So in a span of a couple of years, we we go from one to the other. So that that idea of like corporate like house of cards and one person yeah. can like literally throw the entire Well, I wasn't talking about off. that. Like that's more like cancel culture, but like but I, I, I think, just think it's it's an extreme yeah. example, but it's just funny how like one little right. thing can mm-hmm. just completely derail like oh, the yeah. branding and trust that a company had, had built up. That's the world we're one in. One person makes one tweet and then all of a sudden it goes right. A very extreme form of that. I get it, but I'm just, just no, to illustrate No, that. you have a great point, but even the creative marketing aspect, like say you're working on a video campaign and you have all these components for this campaign, right? One person's opinion at the yeah. top could literally make the house fall. That's what I meant by house of cards. Like it, it all it takes is one person, even though everyone else, say 15 people approved it, right? One person could change that entire thing. And Especially go back to if stage they're one. The, the top of the chain. Yep. Where it's like, you, they may not have been involved in anything and they are just... They're the decision maker, though. Yep. And then, like, they've got the clout and the money to be like, yes yep. or no. It's just stuff to be prepared for if yes. you're going to work just in know. this industry. Things move slow. Speaking of um, preparation and just uh, this will be like the, uh, the last question on the sure. corporate life thing. And then we're yeah. going to transition over. We're getting to the good part, folks. I promise. But you got to build stuff up. Um, for oh. people that are coming out of like school or just trying to get work and maybe they want to see what life is like outside of freelancing or they want to do the corporate thing and freelancing at the same time to make extra money and income streams and that kind of thing. What were these companies? Cause I think it's interesting. What, what were these companies looking for? Like when you were getting hired for these corporate video jobs, like was there anything that they were looking for that you didn't expect or like, like, cause creativity is kind of a subjective, you know, thing. So it's like, like how did they, like how would they figure out or interview? Like what would they ask to be like, yeah, we're going to go with this guy to be our videographer versus like another person. Well, at least I'll, from your experience. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know because I feel like I've I've never really been the decision maker like that. I've never really been the one hiring. Well, I, I guess just from being the other side of being the interviewee. Yeah, like, I, I think like, it's it's personality, man. Like at least, like for example, the RSA thing. Yep. The only real reason I think I got that job is because the job I had before it, which actually started as an internship, was like the same role, different market. But like the same, like so doing I was, the same thing, but for a, just a different, like, you know, it was like global insurance, property loss prevention to cybersecurity. So I think for that, but I don't know, man, it's a lot of like, do you vibe with the people? It, sometimes it could just be like a conversation where that, that hiring manager or like, you know, your future boss just goes, I don't know. I really liked this person. I really vibed with their energy. I think they'd just be a great fit with the team. At least when I went to Colette, you know, cause I didn't work for I didn't have any travel experience. You know what I mean? I did travel and do my own little content creation when I would go on my own trips. I enjoyed taking photos and stuff like that, but I had no experience in that space. And I just think that the only real reason why I got that job was because I really vibed with the team. Like we just, and we're still like friends to this day. Like me and Austin went to like our boy Kyle's like wedding in Greece. You know what I mean? Like we just, there was a, 
just a dynamic that sometimes you can sense in the process. Not not to say that, you know, sometimes there's connections where, you know, someone, someone uh, you know, works at the company and they slip your paper on the top of the resume stack. You know what I mean? There's that too. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I will say I definitely plugged Austin. <laughs> I was like, you guys like her? You like the freelance work that I do? Well, the, the other half of that is Austin. So there's that element too. But I think that, you know, just be yourself. Don't try to force things. And it's not always about the resume. I think a lot of people are getting better at kind of vetting you in the sense where they can see um, your potential. You know what I mean? And then this is all, again, like my opinion. I, I don't really know. I'm not, I've never been in the, the seat where I've hired someone, but that's what I would look for, at least now mm. in my own company setting. You know what I mean? That, you just, it's, I think you just have to be like the right fit and yep. you, and you know, you know what I mean? You know, everyone can learn to do something if you give them the chance, but you got to like them too, you know? So they got to they gotta work within the company culture and the right. team culture. And the exactly. Dynamic. So, yeah, I would, I mean, yeah, I don't really have much to add to that. I think going <laughs> off that, I would say companies are just looking for, yeah, you, you, you got to be motivated. You got to, you know, you got to want to work and. You have to want to learn and, and get better and, and be flexible and be chill. You know, if you actually do want to be creative and you give off that energy and you want to be like solution oriented, I'm pretty sure people are going to feel that they're going to want to hire you. So that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> the transition from corporate gigs or whatnot into just being kind of your own boss and freelancing. So I've talked about this on the show as well. Um, it's a two part question. One that decision to go into and it's, it might be a little di- bit different for each one of you. The decision to go into freelancing was that a cutoff? Like I can't do this. I got, I got to do freelancing and that's it. Or was it an evolutionary thing where like you were picking up things here and there and then it just kind of snowballed the momentum of like, Oh, I can do the freelancing thing full time now. So that's part one is just how did that happen? Was it like one specific moment or an evolution of moments? And then sure. the second part is what aspects of freelancing um did you not realize and do you think people don't realize like when they start it they go like oh it's gonna be great it's gonna do this and then it's like no wait a minute like you are now responsible for everything um because i've had i've i've talked about that at length too so two-part question for each of you and you know whoever wants to go well our experiences are again drastically different you know what i mean because i feel like austin you've always been freelancing from the start whereas i that's why I'm in, and that's why yeah. I'm interested to hear yeah, just because two, I want to hear both sides of it. I think there's yeah, I think there's like two parts to each part too because well you know when you asked was there like a definitive moment that we were like this is it versus like was it a gradual thing we had been working together and freelancing together for a long time and that even, even passion projects in there Almost too. Almost 10 so, years too. Yeah. Yeah, so so we um you know, but even before we became a legitimate business, you know, we had just been working together for so long that um, it, it, we kind of just already were this like collective thing, right? But, you know, we both each had our own experiences that led us to be like, okay, th- this needs to be real right now. And I think Henry's, you know, I'm going to tell you right you now. Go into yeah, that. I yeah. will, because that is like kind of the birth of, of house, like the, the real house. Because the real and I was gonna lead, I was going to lead right in my next. This is perfect. This is going to yeah. lead right in my next question. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, like house was a collective before it was a real thing. You know what I mean? Like me and Austin were, you know, we operated it together. We were, but we were separate. We were like sole proprietors working under one brand where we'd bring in our own work and then do it together as like the team. I always had like a job on the side. So while I was freelancing and we were kind of like, servicing if you will this collective um i you know i had i i was comfortable you know i mean i've i've been on my own since i graduated college so i always needed what was comfortable to try and like survive and i just don't think at first i was ready or aware that i could freelance the whole way even when i started you know started doing taxes and i was like oh wow like this is what i made on as like a side income from freelancing like this is you know i could live off this i mean maybe not <laughs> to a certain standard that I am, or I was then, you know what I mean? But um, truthfully, dude, it was the pandemic that really was like the ripping of the bandaid off. Like, cause I worked in travel. Um, Austin had already left and to pursue some other freelancing endeavors, but I stayed at collect. Cause I was like, dude, you know, I've been here for like two years. I'm comfortable right now. I like traveling. I like my team. Am I happy with the work all the time? No, but this is an environment that I I'm comfortable in. Pandemic happened. I got furloughed. And I started seeing a lot of my friends getting laid off. And I just kind of knew 
that, oh, wow, you know. People might not know what for load is, though. That's when um, I didn't know until it happened to you. That's <laughs> like when you, yeah, for, that's a good point. For those who don't know what being for load is, it's you're not laid off or fired. You are basically like your employment is put on pause. So like they no longer pay. Yeah, it's a holding pattern. Yes, exactly. It's, they, it's, it's purgatory. I was yeah. about to say it's you're in purgatory. Yeah, yeah, and like either they bring you back in or they lay you off. In my case, I did end up getting laid off like three months into the furlough, but on the side. I was kind of preparing for it. And I was like, Austin, like we're going, we're going down to a CPA. We're going to, we're going to get our LLC. We're going to file. Um, we're going to open up a joint bank account. We're going to get a, you know, a tax ID. We're going to get the studio. So from a branding and like, I guess, social aspect, you were working in the collective of house, but then it this, already is, the existed. Tra- this yes. is the transition from like, okay, yeah, we're presenting to the world that we're a collective, but now on the back end from a business and legal perspective, no, we are this thing. Yes. Gotcha. Whereas we weren't before. Gotcha. Not to say we didn't have like, you know, some struggles along the way. Like again, we built this company, we launched this company officially during a global pandemic where and we had this studio now. So we opened up the this new world to all this overhead. We were like, well, shit, how are we going to pay this stuff? You know, a lot of our clients kind of like, I don't want to say disappear, but a lot of our work as a, as you know, when we were freelancing together, all these jobs that we had lined up kind of like were put on pause or, or were eliminated completely. Um, but that was like, that's where everything really kicked off, dude. And, you know, we're three years running now as like a legitimate LLC. So I think whatever we're doing, it, it is working, even when some months, you know, are tight <laughs> for sure. So uh, why the name House? Oh. It's a long story. It's a shortened version of like an old alias that we were working off of. But now just to say what we say now, you know, I'm Henry. That's Austin. <laughs> H, how it just it's it's almost like a like multiple meanings where it's like Henry and Austin, it put put those together. It's house, but it's also like German for like an actual house, like a home. And we're a content house. And then we kind of came up with this tagline called where creativity lives. You know, playing up that we're in Rhode Island based, the creative capital. So there's all these multiple. Hence the name of the show. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, dude. So, you know, it's got multiple meanings. And like, it's funny because some people come up to us, like Kyle, for example, people will call us Haas. Yeah. So it doesn't register with them like what house even is, even though it's it's literally just like a regular house, like how it's <clears> pronounced, <throat> what it means. Like, so you, sh- you should now trademark Haas when you, um, if, if you ever open up like a Southern branch and then. <laughs> That yeah, way, that way, you get, that way you just corner the market on that as yeah. well, and then make it seem like a separate. Like you have you have house and then house, like right. house, right? Full service video production. But I don't know, man. It's stuck, and like this logo that we created, which is super simple, like by, but it just it clicked, and I just feel like we started noticing that people were really like resonating with it. Like even we just slap this like little like you know we call it a stamp at the end of certain videos where it's like oh wow, it's almost like the seal, like where you know that we worked on this. You know what I mean? So. I don't know, just over time, the brand just kind of stuck and we got a lot of support and it's just, that's what we're rolling with right now. Yeah. Hey everybody, it's Jason, the host of the Creative Capital Show. Just wanted to remind everybody that this was a two-part episode, so you just listened to part one of two of the story of House PVD, where I sat down and talked to Henry and Austin about their origin story and, you know, just going through how they learned about video and what really led to the beginnings of House. The second part of the episode will talk more about House as a business, uh, Austin and Henry's insights on video content creation, and you know how it works with marketing, uh, how they run the business, you know, from both behind the scenes and in front of the lens, all that good stuff. So if you were listening to dive into more of the business aspects of this episode. Uh, There was so much good content, we just had to split it up into two parts. So that is in part two. So if that's what you're looking for, uh, that is definitely covered in part two in great detail. Uh, So please go check it out. And that's it for this episode of The Creative Capital Show. Thanks for listening. And a special thanks goes to our guests, Austin Dellen and Henry Kerskins of House PVD. The Creative Capital Show is hosted, recorded, edited, mixed, and produced by me, Jason Sylvia. You can listen to The Creative Capital Show over at our website, creativecapitalshow.com. We're also available on Anchor FM, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast hosting platforms. If you like the show, please subscribe. It helps the show out a lot. And be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, 
TikTok, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I hope you enjoyed the show, and until next time, keep on creating.